for all of our uh, students involved in the program. Uh, I'm Mike Malinowski. I'm one of the vascular surgeons at Medical College of Wisconsin. We have a really great uh, faculty lineup to go over some of the questions that you may be having about a career in vascular surgery um, and thoughts about uh, career path, uh, residency, fellowship options, and really just the overall profession in general. Uh, we're, we're joined tonight um, by Dr. Ashley Gutwine from Indiana, Dr. Louis Cabani from Henry Ford, uh, Dr. Matt Smeds from uh, St. Louis University, and John Catramoni from Cleveland Clinic. They'll each be doing uh, individual topics, uh, looking at uh, vascular surgery as a career option. Uh, during this particular format for MBSS, uh, we are going to have the chat box open. So if you have questions, please uh, enter in the chat box and we'll uh, talk about it either in between sessions or at the end. Um, followed by this uh, at 6 p.m. will be our virtual residency fairs. We have uh, 12 programs involved tonight, and uh, that will include uh, representation from Cleveland Clinic, Indiana University, Loyola University. Mayo Clinic, Michigan State, Northwestern, Southern Illinois University, St. Louis University, The Ohio State, uh, University of Iowa, University of Wisconsin, um, as well as Washington um, uh, University as well. That will be a particular format. We'll have uh, individual talks by each program that's represented, and then we will also have some time for individual breakout rooms so you can uh, visit programs of interest. Please make sure um, that you visit multiple programs um, so you can uh, look at uh, the, the wide variety that we have represented tonight. Uh, the one thing about vascular surgery that all of our faculty can attest to, they'll bring it up in their talks, is for those students who are interested in really a profession that is filled with excellence, not only technical, but clinical excellence, um, a profession where you're demanded in every single corner of the hospital, uh, vascular surgery is, is certainly a great profession for that. Um, so if you've thought about highly technical professions before, um, interventional radiology, interventional cardiology, um, trauma surgery, those type of things where there can be high acuity, but then there's really highly complex elective cases. Uh, this could certainly be the career path for you. And without much more ado, I will turn it to our first talk about what exactly is vascular surgery. All right, welcome everyone. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen. My name's Ashley Gutwein. I am one of the vascular surgeons at Indiana University. Um, and I was asked to give a talk on what exactly is vascular surgery. Um, so full disclosure, I'm a vascular surgeon and I really like what I do. So I'm probably slightly biased. Um, so what exactly is vascular surgery? Um, this actually is a really good question. And I feel like there's still probably 50% of the hospital that doesn't fully understand. But what I like to think is that we do, uh, diagnose and treat and provide comprehensive, comprehensive care for conditions that affect the circulatory system. So basically what that means is that we operate and treat um, and diagnose uh, problems with the arteries and veins in the neck, um, arms, abdomen, pelvis, and legs, um, excluding the intracranium, and then also the heart. And I think the one thing here that I like to focus on is that we provide comprehensive care where we are surgeons and that is what we do probably 70% of the time or 50% of the time, but we spend a lot of time diagnosing and medically managing these patients as well. Uh, so when we think of the common pathologies that we see, um, probably one of the more common one is acute and chronic ischemia or not enough blood legs, blood flow uh, to the legs, arms, and mesentery. Um, this can be gangrene. These are people that are at risk of limb loss and we can kind of uh, treat them medically, um, and then often have to also uh, do surgery, whether it be acute and ur urgently overnight, or chronic and more planned complex revascularizations. Um, carotid occlusive disease. Uh, whenever we think of strokes, you have to ask yourself, where did the stroke come from? Um, and quite often, it is uh, secondary to carotid occlusive disease, and we can do we can do endarterectomies and stents along those lines to prevent strokes in the future. 
Um, aneurysms is one area that I think a lot of medical students get excited about because there's a lot of technology and a lot of big cases and, and interesting things that are happening on this front from thoracic branch devices and fenestrated grafts um, to complex open repairs that are really uh, life-saving um, and very, very technically challenging. Um, we are colleagues with our trauma surgeons and at most institutes, you'll be doing a lot of the, their arterial and venous injuries. Probably the two most common would be blunt thoracic aortic injuries, where we place T-bars or covered stents over tears in the, the aorta, um, just distal typically to the subclavian, um, or more at true, at more true uh, gunshot wounds and knife injuries to, to arteries and veins. Um, we really do help the whole hospital, I would say, um, in the world of iatrogenic injuries. The, we help care for inadvertently placed lines into arteries. We help with the cardiac team um, for their help with their ECMO cases, help with uh, complications from access from cardiac procedures, things along those lines, um, aortic dissections. Um, and then we kind of go into some of our more elective less stressful aspects of our job, varicose veins, venous insufficiency, dialysis access, things along those lines. Um, so when I think of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I think the first and foremost important aspect is getting a diagnosis, because if you don't have the right diagnosis, you're not going to actually be able to help patients. Um, and we have a few different tools in our toolbox. And I think one that's very interesting is that everyone that graduates from a vascular surgery residency or fellowship and becomes a registered physician in vascular interpretation, which basically means you are skilled and can have a vascular lab that does ultrasounds and ABIs and things along those lines to help you determine what the problem is and once you and and follow them long term. Um, a routine portion of our day is looking at CT scans and complex 3D reconstruct. Uh, reconstructions, intravascular IFIS, uh, ultrasound, angiograms, things along those lines, and of course, physical exam to kind of figure out what's going on um, and start managing the patient. Once we've figured out what's going on, then we can say, hey, we've got every 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 tool in the toolbox. We can't just do one thing. We can treat them medically. We can do endovascular surgery. We can do open surgery. Um, and that gives us kind of a, a little bit of a a headway on some other specialties because we we do have everything that we can offer and give them truly comprehensive care. Um, here you can see a picture of a long segment SFA uh, occlusion that we were able to stent open, um, minimally invasive, go home the next day, uh, potentially limb saving, um, no big surgeries, no big incisions, but at the end of the day, not everybody is a candidate for that. And we still have pathology that just is not treated well with stents. So we have to have other tools in our toolbox. So we can do um, what this would be a uh, femoral end arterectomy because stents don't do particularly well there because due to a bifurcation and kind of the location. And you can see here that that big piece of calcium that we took out would not do well, particularly there with the stent. So we kind of have everything in our toolbox and we can offer it to all to patients. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool is not only are we in every portion of the body, um, but we have a very, very wide breadth of what we can offer um, and what our day-to-day -day looks like. So we're doing small procedures that are lower risk and less stressful, um, such as vein ablations. It's basically a fancy IV and you burn a vein, uh, dialysis access. But then we also have cases that are a little more complex and take five, six hours and lots of planning and can be more stressful. Um, here you have an aortic endarterectomy and a fenestrated graft. So uh, day to day, you can have a one to two, a few one to two hour surgeries, or you could kind of have one day a week where you do all your big cases. So it's a very, very large variety. And um, this is kind of highlights the the we have everything in our toolbox because it's not uncommon that you would have a problem in the pelvis and pelvic arteries are surgically a little bit more difficult to recover from. So they do well with stents. And here you can see that we can stent the artery in the pelvis and then clean the artery out of the groin. So kind of all the tools in the toolbox to take care of patients. Um, one thing that's really different about us is we, we see our patients for life. Um, you see them and you meet them sometimes in the worst the, what, the worst portion of their, their life, they're having a major problem. Um, and you get to work with them through that. And then they come back to you for the rest of their life. Because typically after you've had surgery, it's not just, okay, your incision's healed, be on your way. Um, this is somebody that's going to come back if they've had a bypass every three months until they're completely 
uh, a year out and then every six months and then every year, your aneurysms typically come back every year. So it's something that gives you an opportunity to build relationships with patients, which long-term can really lead to um, a positive uh, feeling like you're doing something for patients and positive outcomes. And it's one of the few surgical subspecialties that does that. Um, the other thing that everyone gets really excited about is our technology. It's something that's changing um, daily, if not weekly. Um, we have here just kind of a multitudes of things that we can do from revascularization. We have three or four different uh, mechanical aspiration devices. We've got multiple balloons, some of which are drug coated. We get a new stent that does better in certain locations about every month. Um, multiple closure devices, kind of something that's always changing. So a lot of the medical students that are interested in technology and engineering can fall into this. Mm -hmm. um, the aortic stent graphs, once again, uh, five or six different um, graphs on the market changing. They're on their multiple uh, tech, uh, multiple generations in each one getting better. Once again, and a very big area of technology and innovation. Um, one that's very kind of specific is one of our hybrid operations is the T-car where we basically are able to, to avoid um, causing a stroke from the aortic arch doing from a transfemoral stent by going directly from the carotid. Um, so it's one of the one of the procedures that's very specific to vascular surgery because you have an incision um, to kind of safely get your stent up, but then you also um, are using wires and catheters to place the stent. So it's one of our hybrid operations. Um, one thing that people will say about vascular surgeons is we're kind of the surgeon surgeon. Um, we kind of support things throughout the hospital that so other proce uh, proceduralists can do their surgeries and their procedures. Um, level one trauma centers usually have to have a vascular surgeon available. Oncology for their arterial and venous reconstructions, neurosurgeons uh, like us for their spine exposures or if they inadvertently hit something, um, dialysis access, uh, cardiology with their access site complications, cardiovascular surgery with things along those lines of access site, ECMO, um, and then we also take care of pediatric patients as well. There's no, uh, so you'll take care of everyone from basically birth to death. Um, if you're a vascular surgeon. When I think of uh, typical work week, you're gonna usually have two or three OR and cath lab days, um, one to two days of clinic. Um, your call is very dependent on practice. For example, I'm taking call uh, typically two weeknights a month and then one weekend every two months. Um, I have eight partners. Um, if you're gonna be going to a smaller private practice, it's gonna be more frequent. Um, some people will have to take like a week on, week off, things along those lines, but those tend to be lower volume calls as well. Um, you can have, you can kind of tailor your practice to being say, I want to do the big risky surgeries, or I kind of want to do a few dialysis access and vein ablations and things along those lines. Um, so you can really tailor it to what, what you want at that point in your time. Um, and then if we're looking at job outlook, if you kind of, there's 3,000 practicing vascular surgeons, if you compare that to about 25,000 practicing general surgeons and 120,000 um, general practitioners. So we're a very small specialty, um, but we're expected to have a 5% growth over the next 10 years. And right now, if you go to the SVS job rank, they have about 360 jobs available and if you look through that, almost every state has one. And I know most people that have graduated can usually get a, a job at least close to where they want to be. Um, so when I think of what we are is we're, we're diagnosticians, uh, we're surgeons, we're endovascular therapists. And at the end of the day, I think we just try to take care of patients. Um, so thank you. And I'll give it on to the next person. Ashley, thanks so much for a great talk. And I love highlighting a couple of points that are of vascular surgery. One is the innovative nature where I think everybody has something to contribute. You know, there's there's just so many different aspects to, to contribute to. Ash, let me put you on the spot a little bit. For each presenter tonight, I just want to ask uh, three different questions. Uh, what's your favorite case? When did you decide on vascular surgery? And what was your next up for career choice if it wasn't going to be vascular surgery? Well, um, so my favorite surgery is probably a carotid endarterectomy. Uh, most of the time. That would probably be my most, most my favorite procedure. I actually found vascular surgery very late. Um, I didn't figure it out until my fourth year of medical school, quite honestly. I was going to be an interventional cardi cardiologist until I realized I really didn't like medicine and I liked surgery. So it kind of married the 
I get to work with my hands and operate and take care of some of the sicker, older patients and do endovascular and also get to operate without having to do general medicine, if that makes sense. Oh, that's perfect. Uh, Ashley, thanks for a great talk. And we'll now switch to uh, Dr. Kamani from Henry Ford, talking about how to make an impression on vascular surgery and to start the path of getting on the specialty if it's something that you're interested in. But once again, I know we have a lot of participants on right now, which is great. Um, if you put any comments in the chat box uh, to the presenters, I'll uh, bring it up for you so that uh, we can have the panelists uh, discuss it. And I think Ashley, if you stop sharing, Louie, you may be able to Uh, I should be sharing my screen. At least it says you're sharing my screen. Sharing screen. Perfect. There you go. Can you see me? Angela, is my uh, screen being shared? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, and one thing, Louie, before you start, uh, sorry, guys, use the Q&A box, and at the, not the chat box for this particular format, so the Q&A box if you have a question. Sorry, Louie. Oh, no problem. Hi, I'm Louis Gabani. I'm a vascular surgeon at uh, Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, and uh, it's nice to see the attendance, 51 attendees. I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed, uh, and thank you uh, for getting the word out there. I think this is an exciting format, uh, and Mike uh, takes credit for uh, getting us uh, on board and, and uh, making sure everybody's doing their job. Um, it's really exciting to see so many people interested in vascular um, so uh, how do you make an impression on your vascular surgery rotation? Um, that's been the past uh, to me to talk the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, let's see. For some reason, I don't want to. There you go. So the first thing I have is, is, you know, when you start your rotation, stay calm and use your resources. And you do have a lot of resources there. Um, if any of you are part of the site of vascular surgery or uh, local VSIG, there's a lot of uh, stuff you can use. One thing that uh, the Vascular Surgeon, Surgery Society recently um, put out there is a whole website dedicated to medical students, and it's called choosevascular.com. If you haven't uh, opened that up, you should go examine it and, and play around with it. There is a lot of uh, uh, resources for students. Um, uh, there is a lot of uh, up-to-date conferences. Um, there should be some links of how to um, apply for student scholarship to go to these conferences. Um, and there's a lot of links on there uh, to local advocates, uh, vascular certain advocates in your community that you can reach out to. So definitely to uh, look up choosevascular.com, a lot of movies uh, to look to. Uh, the, if you go to the SVS website, there is a 10 steps uh, for uh, preparing for successful vascular surgery integrated residency application. That's not only for your application, but there's a lot of good information there about how to um, impress uh, people during your, um, during your clerkship. Uh, V-SIGs are very important. If you look at the site of vascular surgery, there's vascular surgery interest groups uh, that are out there. Be involved, figure out who's your advocate um, and, and reach out to them. And if you don't have a vascular surgery interest group in your hospital, in your area, I definitely recommend going to uh, the uh, vascular surgery interest groups in your area. Everybody on that list, I, I was uh, looked at it, um, uh, is, is dedicated to helping students and is uh, very interested in, 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 making, uh, in making the new generation of vascular surgery surgeons a success. So please uh, check that out. If you don't have a vascular surgery interest group in your uh, hospital, uh, reach out to the people on those uh, key lists. And if you want to do away rotations, that key list is also an important resource for you too. Uh, M1s, M2s, there's a lot of resources for you. Reddit posts, uh, uh, there's a very nice TED, uh, uh, TEDx uh, conference on vascular surgery. What, uh, there's the SDS presidential address on SDS mentorships. Definitely look up audible bleed and behind the knife. I'm really impressed when I have a, a medical student on my service and they said, hey, I've listened to article, uh, audible bleed the last 
uh, episode with such and such uh, and, and starts discussing it with me. This shows me that there's another level of interest there. Um, there's a, again, these are all on the SBS uh, website, but if you go to the, there's a gold combat, uh, combat manual for vascular surgeons, tells you the ABCs of vascular surgery. Um, there's a vascular surgery section on Houston DeBakey Methodist YouTube channel uh, that has a lot of good uh, resources for, for medical students. And again, uh, the m I really expect you guys to, uh, to be uh, participating in the SBS online journal clubs. And, and knowing what's going on in vascular surgery, if you're interested in that. When do you place your surgical rotations? Um, this comes up uh, not infrequently when I'm talking to uh, students. You really don't want to be too early. Uh, you know, that's really obvious. You want to kind of uh, understand how to deal with patients and, and the, the, the nuances of uh, doing a presentation um, and the workup and diagnosis. So you don't want to be in the first few, day, a few rotations, but it's really more important, don't do it too late. Don't make it at the end of the year because you want to build that mentorship. You want to get to know the vascular surgeons. You want them to uh, reach out and, and make the phone call if you want to do array rotations. If you do it too late in the year, you lose out on that. Um, so uh, try to do it somewhere in, in, in the middle. Very, very important. I think this is the most important thing I could uh, tell you guys as, 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 as medical students. Be kind and respectful to everybody. Um, you know, that's basic, basic advice, I know that, but yeah, it's not uncommon you got these very small medical students that are a little bit obnoxious and that rubs everybody the wrong way. Uh, you know, uh, on Monday morning, come in and say, hey, how was your weekend? Even to the, to the to not only to, to the residents and to the, um, to the staff, but also to the nurses, uh, to the scrub techs in the OR, to the nurse practitioners. It's everybody uh, is evaluating you when you're doing your rotation. Help in any way. You, 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 you're on the rotation. Nobody expects you to know how to operate, but uh, you need to kind of figure out how to help and how to be useful. Uh, moving patients. Uh, to, just today, we had a patient that's been in the hospital since Friday waiting for a CT scan. And the fourth year uh, medical student said, hey, I'll, th I'll wheel him down to the CT scanner to get a CT scan. You know, that's a lot of brownie, brownie points uh, for her. Uh, it's these little things that uh, stick out. Uh, anything that you can do to be helpful and uh, uh, be part of the team, uh, you should always uh, be looking for that. Put SCDs on patients, for example. Be ready to change the uh, dressings in the morning. May, when you're in the OR, ask the nurse if you could to put the Foley in shave and clean and prep the skin. These are all simple things that you can do uh, that um, help you differentiate from, from everybody else. Advocate for your patients. And, and this is really something that uh, goes a long, long way for a big way for, for attendings. We're busy, the residents are busy. When you're following one or two patients and you get to know them and you pass by during the day and you talk to them and you get to know the family and you get to know uh, what, what, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And you share that with your attending. When I'm rounding and the medical student says, hey, Dr. Kibani, I just want to know, Mr. Smith, you know, he recently had a divorce. He's having a hard time. Uh, he doesn't have anybody to take him, to, to take him home from, from, uh, from the hospital. That information to me is so important. It reflects that you form that connection with the, with the patient and also helps me form the connection with the patient. Uh, it's very fulfilling. I think one of the main reasons, um, like uh, uh, we said, is what we love about vascular surgery uh, is that we definitely uh, have this bond with the patient. This bond is not only um, uh, for the operation, but it's lifelong. You know, Ashley mentioned we follow our patients for the for the entirety of their life and, and take care of their vascular problems, um, and that really really resonates with us. And seeing medical students bond with their patients really really is important. Always be reading. I uh, can't stress this hard enough. Um, you know, the, the vascular surgery is not uncommon that uh, daily we're operating until 9, 10 o'clock at night. Um, and you really don't have that much time on, on the rotation. So you need to kind of be able to uh, pick up uh, and read where you, where you are, pick up and read about your patients, pick up and read about the disease process of your patients. And, you know, at this day and age, is, is, is you're not going to be carrying books. I remember when I was a medical student, I had my pockets full of small little notebooks and, and, and uh, pads and, and uh, 
uh, uh, a little pamphlet. That's no longer, I expect, I really find it, I'm very impressed when I have a medical student that has a small uh, iPad that fits in their pocket and where they're not uh, sitting down, um, uh, seeing patients or discussing cases, they're on their iPad reading about uh, 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 the disease process or up to date or something like that. Learn to be efficient. We're not a medicine rotation. Um, and uh, one thing that uh, you need to learn when you're on surgery, you need to be to the point and, and, let, let, and, and uh, not be, and be able to be concise and, and, and efficient. So when you're doing your presentation, this is a, a 38 year old gentleman, has PAD, post up day number two, problem A, B, C, and move on. We do not want a, a, a five, 10, 20 minute uh, presentation. We don't have time for it. You have to be efficient. You have to know the pertinence when you're doing these, uh, when you're doing a rotation. And talk to your residents and fellows, they will help you. I do expect the resident, the medical students when they're on my service to have a patient, one or two patients and present them in the morning to me. Uh, you need to be, work on that presentation. You need to be concise and show me that you can present like a surgeon. Know your attendings. This is kind of important. I, I found this very, very true. I love it when one of the, the students says, hey, Dr. Cabani, I looked at, you know, I didn't realize uh, you, you're board certified in you know, critical care and, and, and uh, dental surgery, cardiac surgery, and vascular surgery. They, they, having that uh, intellect and, and bonding with your attending is important. Um, uh, it goes a long way and shows that you're interested. Read about your appendings. Read, read about your attending. Read about one, of the, one or two of the papers that they recently published and discuss it with them. Be humble. Um, again, we talked about this a little bit earlier on another slide. There's nothing worse than an arrogant medical student. Um, that you know, the, the People don't like that. You're not at that level to be arrogant. Uh, be humble, be kind. Uh, especially to everybody in front of you. Everybody's evaluating you from the scrub tech to the nurses to the janitors. It's not uncommon that I have a, a scrub tech or even a janitor say, hey, Dr. Cavani, you know, we had a medical student. When you're around, he's, he's awesome. But once you leave the room, he doesn't want to help us move the patient. He doesn't want to help us do anything. Uh, that says a lot. Uh, so, you, so put that in the back of your mind. Never be arrogant, uh, neither to the nurses or anybody. In the OR, uh, there's a lot of tips and tricks. Always have your anatomy. You know, the, when, when you're when you're going scrubbing a carotid and arterectomy, be expect you expect to be pimped and asked about the, the the procedure and the anatomy. That's kind of basics 102. It's it's really um, uh, I, I I guess the word to use is it's uh, uh, sad um, when I have a medical student that doing doing a carotid. And I ask him uh, some very basic questions. It's very obvious that he did not read anything about the procedure before he scrubbed in. Um, get some skills. Uh, again, when you, when you your, your chance to shine is very limited as a medical student. If I'm doing a finish up case and I ask a medical student, here, tie this, uh, tie this uh, knot for me. And he says, uh, and it's halfway through the rotation. and says, I don't know how to tie. That says a lot to me about his willingness to uh, to learn and 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 uh, know the fundamentals of what we're supposed to be doing. Be uh, be positive, regardless of the rotations. Uh, there is things that you will learn. Um, uh, I remember I was talking to a cardiologist that he was reminiscing of his vascular surgery rotation, how many hours uh, they spent uh, doing it, uh, and uh, kind of reflected on on uh, his respect for the vascular profession uh, based on his medical student training. So um, remember that, that uh, you, there is something for you to be gained, if not now in the future. Come always with a positive attitude and you'll enjoy the surgery rotation. Don't take criticism too, too seriously. This is key. We're all working hard, we're all tired. And sadly, if we like you, we will pimp you. We will uh, kind of harass you. It's, it's, it's like a fraternity when you're when you, uh, in, in, in the football. If they like you, we will haze you. It's not it's nothing personal. It's just the way a lot of surgeons uh, 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 reflect their, their admiration and their liking at somebody, especially if they're the bottom of the totem pole. Take care of yourself. Don't burn out. If you're going to go wake up at four o'clock in the morning to come and do your pre-rounds, make sure you sleep at nine. And most importantly, have fun. 
uh, that that's I think the key. If you're not having fun, it's, it's it, there's something wrong with the vocation or what you're doing. You need to kind of uh, try to enjoy life. It's it's life's too short, and that's it for me. Okay, thanks for a great talk. I, I didn't know you're actually going to encounter the when to do your surgery rotation. That's a tough question, the way it's recorded now. It's it's in the permanent record, so not <laughs> early, not late, right? It's like the it's like the three bears right in the middle. Yeah. Uh, Louis, great uh, presentation. I think to everybody who's on the line, one of the big things that Louis kept hitting on was just, you know, really respectful engagement in a team effort. And I think that's any surgery rotation anywhere. It's so important. Um, Louis, you're not going to get away, even though you ran a little <laughs> bit over without the, without the, the uh, questions here, but I want to know your best case ever. What was the next close to vascular surgery? Um, and then when did you decide? Uh, so I, I have a lot of favorite cases, and I, I guess the, the cases I really enjoy the most are the new cases that we do. So I did my first uh, thoracic branch endograph a few weeks ago, uh, got training on it by Gore, and, and came back and, and did it to a patient that really needed it. They, they couldn't tolerate it twice, so they didn't bypass. And it's fun. I can't tell you how fun it is. Every year I've been practicing, I've had one or two new procedures that I've either taught myself or been taught. And, and the, the, the fact that we are continuously evolving, continuously um, learning how to do this in a better manner um, is, is so much fun to me. I really, I think that's, that's what motivates me. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm an early adopter, I, I, I know myself. And, and trust me, there's a lot of new things to adopt. And sometimes, sometimes you wish you'd never adopted the new technology, I can tell you that. But at the same time, when you adopt something that's uh, makes a huge difference to a patient's life. It, it, it's, it's really fun. What was the other two questions I forgot? Oh, like, when did you decide to do vascular, Louis? And, and what else did you consider? Oh, God. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very loaded question for me, Mike. Um, I, I decided to do vascular surgery. After general surgery, I did cardiac surgery. In the middle of my cardiac surgery fellowship, I was working with uh, C.W. Aker in Madison and uh, saw the, all the endovascular stuff he was doing, all the thoracal abdominals he was doing. I said, wow, this is what I want to do. I think what, what really uh, motivated me, you could see that the innovation um, in the field. Uh, and like I told you, I love innovation. I love the new products. And I could see there was so much new innovation that just uh, was challenging and exciting. And that's kind of what, when I decided I wanted to do a, do a vascular surgery fellowship. That's great. Louis, thanks. And our next uh, presenter will be Dr. Smeds from St. Louis University, uh, giving, I'm um, sure, a fantastic talk on which, va which vascular surgery training pathway is right for me. And the good Dr. Smeds will also be uh, helping run our virtual residency fair after this. Matt. All right. Can everybody see my screen there? I guess nobody can answer me, so I'm just going to assume you can. Mike, you see my screen? Uh, I can't yet, Matt. I see just a panel view. Let's see. How about now? Yes, perfect. All right, so I'm Matt Smeds. Uh, I'm a, a vascular surgeon at St. Louis University, and I was asked to discuss which vascular surgery training pathway is right for me. And I can't really answer that question for you, but I'm gonna talk about both of the pathways and maybe help you come to that realization uh, for yourself. I don't really have any financial disclosures relevant for this talk, but I will say I did train in a five plus two uh, training program. So I got board board certified in general surgery, and then I went on to a vascular fellowship. I have worked in several institutions that have both training paradigms. We have both of them here at St. Louis University, so I think I do have a good understanding of both, uh, both pathways. So before you figure out what kind of pathway uh, you should take to become a vascular surgeon, you need to figure out why you want to be a surgeon. This was a paper written in uh, Time a, num a number of years ago, which really describes why I went into surgery, clearly. Um, uh, but looking at me, you know, you know why. Uh, and so this mind, this paper did say that to be a surgeon, you had to be practical minded. You had to possess a high IQ. You need to remain calm in difficult situations and you had to be good with your hands. And so if you meet, have those criteria, then maybe you should become a surgeon. What do vascular surgeons do? Ashley talked about this. This is what my friends think I do, sit around and roll around in money. Uh, what my mom thinks I do, take care of varicose veins. What I think I do, sit in front of a computer entering stuff into Epic. But what we really do, same picture that Ashley showed, we treat peripheral blood vessel problems. I'm not gonna get into this 
a whole lot since she talked about it so well. What's involved with vascular surgery procedures? Well, it's a different answer now than it was 20 years ago, which is what makes vascular surgery so fun. This is a painting um, of uh, called the Gross Clinic, and it just represents how things can change in medicine in general uh, in a re relatively rapid amount of time. Uh, this was called the Gross Clinic. It was painted in 1875, and it was really painted to describe the emergence of surgery as a healing art. And so this was, was depicting the conservative treatment of osteomyelitis of the leg. And so prior to this, people just got amputations, basically. Now, the same uh, artist painted a picture 15 years later, and you can see the difference between these pictures. So this is called the Agnew Clinic. It was painted in 1889, same artist. And what you can see is that you'll, you've got sterility now. You've got white uh, uh, white uh, garments on the on the physicians. You actually have an anesthesiologist providing anesthesia care. You have nurses providing care, and so there's been a rapid change in medicine in just in that 15 years. Similarly, in vascular surgery, we, we've had a rapid change in 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 the last 20 or 30 years. You know, this is a standard operating room uh, for most people, but this is a standard operating room for a vascular surgeon, right? So we've brought in these interventional interventional uh, techniques, use of the C arm and doing uh, endovascular procedures. So things do change in medicine. We've gone from doing amputations to doing bypasses, to doing uh, advanced endovascular stuff, to even more weird uh, uh, endovascular stuff. And who knows what's next? We've gone from big incisions for aortic operations down to little punctures uh, for aortic operations. And so things are rapidly changing. So why would you wanna become a vascular surgeon? Ashley said this, real, uh, a lot of these things in her talk, but the reasons that I became a vascular surgeon was that it allowed me to treat a wide variety of diseases throughout the entire body. You have a lot of different ways to get to the same outcome, and it requires thinking outside the box. It, there's access to cutting edge technologies, which Loy uh, uh, discussed when he talked about why he became a vascular surgeon. We have lifelong patients. You can change your practice or your focus over the years, and it's just a great field to be involved with. So how do you become a vascular surgeon? Again, similar to vascular surgery procedures, it's a different answer uh, th uh, now than it was 20 years ago. So, you know, obviously you have to go through college and medical school. Um, classically, you went through five or six or seven years of general surgery residency, and then you did a two-year uh, vascular surgery fellowship. In 2006, um, they started to allow a direct uh, vascular surgery residency directly from uh, medical school. Now, the general surgery and vascular surgery fellowship is often called the five plus two program. Uh, people that graduate from those uh, uh, training, that, that training paradigm come out with board certification in both general surgery and vascular surgery. Now, the, the vascular surgery residency is sometimes called the zero plus five programs, and this is a um, you come out with basically just vascular surgery uh, board certification. So the, the integrated residency or the zero plus five residents um, do 18 months of core general surgery rotations. They have six months that are kind of swing months that can be either uh, vascular or general surgery or kind of surgical or medical uh, rotations. And then there's 36 months of devoted vascular surgery. They have a yearly uh, in-service examination. They have to take the RPVI examination. Uh, and it's basically a, a pretty standard surgical um, residency. The vascular fellowship, uh, in, in contrast, this is what's done after general surgery residency, is 24 months, and it's typically just straight up vascular surgery. So the, the vascular surgery fellow does vascular surgery from day one. They don't really do any other uh, rotations in most uh, training programs. They have a yearly B site. They also do RVVI, like the integrated residencies. Here's a sample. Um, vascular residency rotation from our institution here. So you can see our uh, residents do most of their general surgery in the first three years, uh, and they have kind of increasing vascular surgery responsibility as the years go by. And some of these rotations that they rotate on uh, that are quote unquote general surgery allows them opportunities to do vascular surgery as well, because uh, the VA has a lot of vascular surgery and St. Mary's is one of our private hospital has a fair amount of vascular surgery. And so we kind of sneak in the vascular surgery even in their kind of non- uh, vascular surgery years, and that's opposed to our vascular fellows who are just straight up uh, vascular surgery for the entire uh, two years. So the real question is, does the operative experience differ between um, these two training paradigms? A paper done written a few years ago looked at this, um, and the basic answer is um, 
the operative experience really doesn't differ a whole lot between integrated vascular residents and vascular uh, fellows. If you look at total major operations, there is a difference, and that makes sense, right? Because you're you, you you're comparing a seven year program to a five year program. So total major operations is more in a person who's gone through a fellowship as that compared to a person who's an integrated residency. But if you look at the total number of vascular cases, that uh, it's basically identical. In fact, it might be a little bit more in the zero plus five program. If you look at the breakdown by the type of cases, so peripheral obstruction, uh, aneurysm, endovascular aneurysm, endovascular peripheral obstruction, there's really no difference between, in, between the five plus two training program and the zero plus five training program. The really only difference between the general surgery followed by a fellowship and then in the integrated vascular residency is biliary, small intestine, and large intestine. And I can guarantee you the last time that I did a large intestine, small intestine, or biliary procedure as a vascular surgeon, uh, was when I was a, was a trainee. So I don't do those. And so it really doesn't make any sense necessarily for you to have that experience per se, if you want to be a vascular surgeon. Now, some people talk about the ability to do research and they think that if you do the five plus two, you might have more access to it. Um, several integrated programs are incorporating it in this into the design of their programs. And so they're actually six or seven years in length. And so they have the opportunity to, to do research. Uh, general surgery, obviously, sometimes you can go out to do research during those times. It's not really necessary for matching into vascular surgery, um, but it is an option. My gestalt basically is that the fourth, the 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 fellows, the, the vascular fellows tend to have a little bit more surgical swagger because they've been doing it longer and they've been doing a lot of sur uh, just surgical procedures. And then the residents tend to have a little bit more endovascular swagger because they've been doing endovascular procedures oftentimes since the beginning of their training. But really by the end of the training, they both came out with the kind of equivalent vascular surgical skills. Now, some things to consider when you're deciding whether you want to do an end of, uh, whether to do a vascular surgery fellowship or a vascular surgery residency, you have to think about if geography matters, there's much more general surgery programs out there than vascular training programs. So if you really need to be somewhere from a geographical standpoint, um, that might kind of uh, alter what you do. If you're unsure about vascular surgery, then by all means go general surgery because that leaves a lot of doors open for you. But if you are absolutely certain you want to be a vascular surgeon, I really encourage people to apply for the Integrated Vascular Surgery Residency uh, Program, just because in the end, you're going to come out similarly trained as a vascular fellow. Now, I like having programs that have both fellowships and residencies. We have that here at St. Louis University. Um, frequently, our residents will work together with our fellows, which is kind of nice to see. Here's a picture of a few years ago of our of our senior resident taking our first year fellow through a case. Just to look at some of the match statistics, uh, most recently in 2023, uh, there were 74 integrated vascular surgery residency programs. It was 93 spots. Only one spot didn't fill last year. There were 159 applicants. That's U.S. and uh, uh, international uh, applicants of the U.S. MD senior students. Um, there were 92 applicants and 75 matched into vascular surgery. So there's around an 80% uh, ma match rate. Interestingly, if you look at the DO students, there were 17 students who applied and only four matched into vascular surgery. So there's a much lower match rate for the, U for the US DO uh, students applying for the integrated vascular surgery residency. If you look at the vascular surgery fellowship, there's 97 programs, 94 of them filled last year. Uh, this should say 23, not 21. I just didn't update it. Um, and the number of spots, there's 131, about 153 applicants. Uh, that includes international applicants. And so the match rate is actually higher, if you're a U, especially if you're a U.S. Um, uh, candidate. Uh, this is looking at the integrated residency match statistics. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but basically, if you have a higher match, uh, a higher uh, step score, you're more likely to match. Uh, if you have... Um, um, a higher um, number of research projects, you're more likely to match. And if you have a higher number of presentations, you're more likely to match. So you, sh you should be doing all these kind of academic work to kind of increase your, uh, um, your application. Now, just in, in closing, I think no matter which pathway you choose, uh, becoming a vascular surgeon is um, needed. If you look at the projected growth in the population with chronic conditions, uh, it's skyrocketing for the type of diseases that we treat as a vascular surgeon. And in fact, if you look at the need for vascular surgeons, we are on a trajectory to be in really high need uh, for, for vascular surgeons, especially when, um, when I get old and I retire, you can take over my practice for me. 
similar to um, Ashley, I threw in a slide about, you know, can you have a life as a vascular surgeon? And the answer is yes. Um, I have a smaller group than she does. I'm one of five. So I'm on call one day a week and one week in a month, basically. Typical week, work week, six to eight cases per week, do clinic one day, research, write papers, go to conferences, teach students, uh, and it, it's a great life. So I, I think you should do it. So in summary, vascular surgeons are needed. Both integrated and fellowships are viable options for training. You're going to get trained uh, either way. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. And um, that's it. All right, Dr. Smeds, that was a great talk. You packed in a lot into just a few minutes. I think it's super important for um, the students that are listening to be able to get an understanding, obviously, of the boat, the two training uh, pathways that exist. We are a little tight on time, so I'm just going to ask one uh, question. Um, uh, Dr. Smets, can you give us an idea of what drew you to vascular uh, when all this uh, started for you? Um, so, you know, when I was a medical student, you could not do vascular straight up from uh, medical school. And so I worked with a vascular surgeon named Carl Illig, at, where I went to medical school at the University of Rochester, really kind of enthusiastic guy. Um, and kind of got a lot of people interested in vascular surgery. They had a real strong vascular division there. He's the kind of guy that was would talk to me as a med student saying, okay, so when you do your vascular training, you're going to go here and blah, blah, blah. And so he really kind of pushed me into it. I went off to general surgery kind of thinking I might do vascular surgery. I rotated on vascular surgery as an intern. And I said, what in the world have I gotten into? There's no way I want to do this. People are dying right and left. There's rotting limbs. I'm doing all this wound care. And I, and I actually thought about doing something else because I, I wasn't doing cases as an intern. I was just, you know, I'm taking care of sick patients. Um, and so I thought about pediatric surgery. Um, I thought about <clears throat> colorectal surgery, but then I rotated on vascular surgery as a senior trainee. And I really uh, embraced the kind of the, the new technologies and endovascular management of disease. And I remembered why it was such a cool, um, uh, field to be going into. And that's kind of why I became, and then I had mentors there, obviously, um, Vivian Gatan was our chief and uh, well-known in vascular surgery world and kind of helped me, um, kind of pushed me into that direction. So um, that's the long answer for a, for a short question. That's, how oh, that's great. Asked. That's actually a good segue to our next uh, talk, because it sounds like you had some uh, important mentors that helped you along the way. So um, next up, we're going to have uh, Dr. Quatra Moni, who's from the Cleveland Clinic, is going to be talking to us about how to find a mentor and get what you need from them. So I'll let you take it away there. Great. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate this. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. So again, my name is John. I'm uh, one of the uh, surgeons at Cleveland Clinic, and uh, I'll be talking to you about mentorship. These are uh, two of my favorite quotes in regard to mentorship. Uh, Bob Proctor once said, a mentor is someone who sees more talent and ability within you than you see in yourself and helps bring it out of you. Another one by Mestrius Plutarchus said, the mind is not a vessel that needs filling, but wood that needs igniting. And so, you know, what is a mentor? And in, in my opinion, when you boil it down to it, that mentor is really an experienced and trusted advisor. And you can kind of see there's multiple different roles that mentorship can take, um, but I think this is kind of the essence of it. So I think when we're all honest with ourselves that you know we are all the result of great mentoring, we um, all need somebody to inspire us to, to do better, that can guide us along the path, to do better than we know how to do on our own. How do you find a mentor? You know, there's obviously, a, you're gonna run across a lot of different people you know, in, in your pathway in medicine and surgery and, you know, who, who should you search out and, and, and what are some good tips on finding some, somebody that can really meet your needs? So these uh, three uh, characteristics are often described um, uh, for surgeons being available, affable, and able, but I think that they kind of fit here too, that um, availability is important. In the world it is a small place. You still need access to your mentor. It's not very helpful if they're not available for you when you need them. And you need to be honest with them and you need to not be afraid to ask, you know, to meet with them or talk with them, you know, in your in your times of need. And a good mentor will make that time uh, for you. Affable 
you know, obviously if uh, you fear talking to this person or they're, uh, I don't know, they're, they're mean or, or, or something negative, you're not going to want to go to them and, and listen to them and enjoy your interactions. And I think in, enjoying the interaction is, you know, critical to this, to this relationship. And so being affable is a big part of that. Able. So you need, really need to make sure that you know what you're looking to get out of your relationship uh, with your mentor. It doesn't necessarily have to be specific, and this can change over time depending on where you are in your pathway in surgery. So uh, if I've confused you at this point, I'll just kind of tell you a little bit about how I got to where I, I, I am today. I Start off, I was exposed to surgery early on. My, my, my dad was a general surgeon. Uh, I kind of had in the back of my mind that, hey, I kind of like that. I, I might want to look into that further on. When I went to college, I, I knew I liked science. I liked research. I did some shadowing through some of the opportunities there and thought, you know, I think I, 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 I want to be a surgeon. I like the application of science in, in the medical setting, I like interaction with patients that I'm seeing. I went to school in Philadelphia and that was there that when I was a med student, I came across some people that ultimately inspired me to pursue vascular, Ed Wu and Paul Foley. At that time, Penn had just started an integrated program. Uh, Ed Wu was program director and was instrumental in kind of bringing me along as I was a, as a medical student and fostering my, my interest. He got me involved in research at that early stage and got me involved in the OR and really kind of made the extra effort more than I would say any other attending at that time. And encouraging me to go into vascular and that, that he was a huge reason why I went into it. And Paul Foley um, was a, a fellow at that time when I was a medical student. And I think he also saw my interest and helped kind of kindle that. I think they both, you know, met the three A's that I kind of outlined before. And I don't think I would be here today without them at that stage. And as I progressed to residency uh, at Penn, Ron Fairman and Ben Jackson, and, and now in my career over in Cleveland Clinic, Frank Caputo in particular, they, they've all kind of, as I've evolved, the people I go to for, you know, mentorship have evolved to meet those needs as well. I think it's important to remember that not every interaction, not every person you meet, even if you think earlier on that they might be good for you at that part of your life, that may not always be the case. And it's important to remember that it's okay to move on. Um, you need to have the right mentor for the right time. And it's okay to, if it's not working, to meet your needs that, to, to end the relationship and you can still be friends. And I think uh, just to kind of wrap it up, you know, being a good mentee when it works well, you can really do incredible things. Uh, it's just really finding that person that, uh, you know, that, that you match well with. I'll take any questions now or. Great, John. Thanks for a, a wonderful talk. Um, I, I, it'd be, I'm surprised with how many of my mentors in surgery actually looked like Yoda, John. So I think it's a really <laughs> appropriate picture there. Some of them are, you know, in their late sixties and shrunken down and a little wrinkled, but um, so John, quick, quick question. Um, with with your mentors, did you specifically go out seeking mentors for certain reasons, for letters, because, or were you attracted to them because of certain other qualities that either meshed with you or you thought uh, could help improve your ability through training or a combination of both? And, and have you cut off mentor relationships for certain reasons? For me, it was always somewhat organic chemistry that I had interacting with them. And I think there was their clinical skill their kind of the way they carry themselves, the way they, they meshed, you know, their academic work with their clinical ability. I think that the people I chose kind of embodied what I ultimately saw myself being, and it was more of an organic process. I can't say that I specifically sought somebody out and forced it in a way that maybe it, it, it didn't just come naturally. Um, I can't say I ever formally, you know, sh sh shut, shut off, uh, you know, that, that relationship. I think it just, you know, as everything else, every, things are transient, things change. And as where I was in medical school and training changed, as, you know, my proximity to people, people changed, 
think that's also kind of what led to my mentors changing. I think just being open to that and always being willing to seek out new people and build new relationships um, is kind of how I've incorporated different mentors over, you know, my journey. If that helps. Um, thanks for a great talk. And I, I think this speaks back to what Lue was talking about earlier is these relationships really are mutually beneficial. You know, there, there, there really is a give and a take from both sides. And uh, certainly with our med students on the phone, there's so many things to gain from mentorship that you already know that uh, John just talked about. But then from the, the mentoring side, uh, there's a lot that as attendings, uh, we get out of the relationships with medical students. And uh, so it really does work both ways. So it's a win-win uh, to seek out good mentorship relationships. You can't go wrong. Even if you find a good mentor who's a urologist, they may steer you in the side of becoming a vascular surgeon uh, just in the way they are. So one of my best mentors was a, 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 a gynecologist who was a fantastic surgeon from Duke. So um, don't just look for a vascular surgeon. Um, John, thanks a lot. We're yeah. getting to the... Uh, end of our time here. I don't see any more questions in the Q and A. Um, I think what we can do, Matt, if you're okay with this transition to the virtual residency fair, I do want to thank all of our uh, faculty on the panel tonight. Uh, these have just been great talks, um, and I think they are so conducive to helping uh, med students find a path and in, in what is sometimes more and more limited uh, time and training to figure that out. So uh, it's been fantastic. Yeah, so um, last year we had a straight up virtual residency fair with open rooms and, and some programs wanted to have a brief opportunity to present about their programs to all the um, applicants. And so we've changed the format slightly in that each program will have five minutes to discuss their program. And uh, Angela, are you ready to proceed with the first one or? And then I will say after, the, after these presentations, um, th those programs who have virtual uh, rooms will have their virtual rooms open for another hour and you can go individually visit programs and talk with people from those programs. I don't know if Angela's taking a nap or. <laughs> what? The first speaker is already a panelist right there. All right, perfect. All right, so our first uh, program is going to be the Cleveland Clinic. And um, you guys can share screens if you have any uh, slides. And we're going to ha have a strict time limit of five minutes per talk. So um, I don't know who's doing the speaking for you. I have Nathan Reinert and Nicholas Hole. Yeah, I'm here too. I can just give it. Nick's, they're both here. Dr. Pashmani, do you have the slides? Yeah. Can you see them? Yeah, I can see them there. If you All right. Wanna through them we can kind of do it together yeah okay. you can do talking okay. go ahead sure all righty uh, hey everybody my name is nathan reinard i'm one of the uh, pgy2s of the cleveland clinic and i just want to tell you a little bit about our program uh so we are a zero five program we have both residents and uh fellows right now we're transitioning from uh we, we've now moved on to three residents per year and two fellows per year um, so, uh, that's been going pretty well so far. We work at a, at a very, very large hospital and actually multiple hospitals throughout the Cleveland area. Um, our main campus, as you can see, there is 1400 beds and over a hundred operating rooms. Um, and it's filled with trainees, thousands of trainees, uh, amongst different specialties, which gives you a, a great opportunity to collaborate with other residents, other fellows, um, get great experiences, both in the operating room and outside with those people. Um, we have uh, some new staff members, some who have been around for quite some time. Oops. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> and multiple different locations. So this right here is our Fairview Hospital. When you rotate there as a one, two, and a three, you'll get plenty of opportunities to do endovascular procedures in the cath lab, as well as some lower extremity stuff. Um, and at our other locations, you'll get a variety of different uh, experiences, anywhere from open aortas to lower extremity um, to dialysis uh, access types of experience. Um, our training program focuses mostly on a, um, a mentorship model. So for each month or two months, depending if you're a junior or a senior, respectively, you'll be 
assigned to a certain uh, mentor, or a staff member. And for that month, basically, you're just the apprentice to that mentor. And that comes with a lot of responsibilities of uh, basically running their service and being intimately aware of everything that's going on with that service. And that goes to anything from patient care on the floor to actually planning their cases, talking with the staff directly about what the case is, uh, what you're going to do in the case. Um, and they do hold you to quite a high standard, even at the junior level for knowing what's going on in the service and having an adequate plan going into a case. Um, most of the teams are made up of a senior and a junior. Um, each team will have one senior, either a senior resident or a fellow, uh, and then one or two juniors, depending on how busy the team is. In my experience so far, the, the teams have, have functioned fabulously um, and with a good distribution of, of responsibilities. Um, our education is, is uh, pretty standard, I think. Actually, we might have more education than some other programs. Every Wednesday mornings, we have our M&Ms and didactic conferences. And every Thursday morning, we have uh, some sort of other didactic conference as well. And then every Wednesday evening, Dr. Leiden, who is our chairman, puts on um, an hour-long talk, which is really just kind of a chalk talk, sit around, um, hang out, and talk about some interesting vascular topics. It's a really great time to learn. Um, research is definitely part of our, our program. Um, although we don't have dedicated years to research, you, you are will, uh, welcome to take them if you'd like. Um, we are required to publish one manuscript per year and we're encouraged heavily to get involved um, in presenting at different con conferences uh, nationwide. So it is definitely a large part of our program. We meet multiple times a month to talk about it. Um, as you can imagine with Cleveland Clinic's volume, uh, we have a ton of clinical trials that are ongoing and staff members who are intimately involved in those, which has given us a great opportunity to see a lot of different uh, techniques and, and uh, newer, uh, newer techniques in vascular surgery. Uh, we kind of talked about research a little bit already. Uh, if you want to take research even more seriously, you can get involved in a PhD program as well. Uh, some of our trainees in the past, Dr. Andy Smith here has done that in the past and was successful in doing that. Um, we have people presenting our research all over the country at pretty much every vascular uh, event you can imagine. And our leaders, Dr. Leiden, Dr. Caputo, and Dr. Kirksey, are involved heavily in, in many different uh, vascular surgery societies um, and have a lot of connections in all of those places that can help you uh, move forward in your career. Um, and then really briefly, I'll finish up here with just telling you our, our week. Um, you operate four days a week. You do clinic one day a week. If you want to see some of the most acutely ill patients in the country, the Cleveland Clinic is a great place for you. Um, we have a scale up there in the upper right that just shows you the severity of our patients. Um, at times, that can be very interesting. And at times, I can tell you that can be also very stressful as well. Um, we take call usually once every seven days, and we're off two weekends a month. So really can't complain. But when you're there, you're working 80 hours a week, and you're working hard. Um, but you do get time off to enjoy with all your, all your friends. And um, I think that's probably about the end of my five minutes. Uh, so thank you everybody for listening and I hope to talk to you later. Okay, uh, make sure you go visit um, the Cleveland Clinic's room there after this uh, hour. Um, I think Indiana University is next on the list. I don't know if the speaker is here yet. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, I don't think he's coming. I think that will actually end up being me. Okay. Do you want to talk about the program now or? I can talk about it now. That's fine. Okay. Um, share it screen really quick. So my name, okay, there we go. Uh, my name's Ashley Gutwein. I'm once again, one of the uh, faculty at Indiana University. We're just going to have a brief overview. Um, so we have a integrated and a fellowship. We take one a year in each. So we have a complement of four residents. Um, it was established back in 2009. Um, so we've had 20 graduates. Um, and so we also have two dedicated years of research for the for the integrated. So um, a smaller residency, but we we kind of all get along really pretty well. Um, the faculty, we kind of have a pretty good breadth of uh, faculty. We've got 
um, eight of us. And between all of us, we've got a little bit mixture of some older staff with some more experience and younger staff, uh, all trained at different places. I think myself and Dr. Gupta are two, the only two from Indiana. Everybody else has kind of been spread out that's come in for us. Um, current leadership is my boss, Dr. Raghu Maganahali, um, and then myself and Dr. John Mayub are going to be your associate program directors. Um, we cover quite a few hospitals. Um, our main hospital is Methodist, which is um, a level one vascular center and level one trauma. Um, we have two hybrid rooms and our dedicated core for vascular and CV um, surgery. We cover the Rotaba VA, which is a regional VA. We actually have a hybrid room there as well and probably do a higher number of fenestrated grafts at the VA uh, than probably at our main hospital right now. So we have a pretty good, a pretty good um breadth of, of pathology at the VA. We also have some satellite hospitals, which you aren't directly responsible for, but then they do feed into the downtown hospitals for some of the bigger cases. Um, right now we are covering um, IU West, IU North, IU Saxony, and then also Lafayette. So it kind of increases the volume of patients downtown for more complex cases, um, but you would not be directly responsible for them. Um, we also cover Eskenazi, which is our county hospital, and it's a level one trauma. And then we cover IU University, which does a bunch of our uh, bigger GI and cancer cases, and then uh, Riley and pediat or Riley's our pediatric hospital. Um, so the way that we kind of spit it, spit it up is that we have two main services, the Methodist Hospital and then the VA Hospital um, service, and there'll be two residents or fellows on at each time. 